So this is about me. I teach here at Berkeley. I'm primarily in the business school, but I'm also in the engineering school and the uh, law school in the economics department. Uh, I did most of my training at the Wharton School, uh, taught at some other places. These are some of the companies I've worked with in the last couple of years, uh, mainly in, in finance and, and tech. Um, uh, you know, some CBG and some, uh, uh, and some retail. Uh, and I want to start off because I'm really going to focus on, you know, data and how retailers have to be data-driven companies, how they have to be software companies, have to be technology companies. And I'm going to take a look at the way in which kind of online retailers or Amazon have been exploiting this to eat the lunch of the bricks and mortar retailers and how the bricks and mortar re retailers can, can respond. Okay. So that will be basically the, the thrust of my, uh, of my, my focus. Um, and so it's, it's partially going to be about the retail environment and the physical environment, and you've heard a lot about that. But really, it's about kind of what happens before you get to uh, the physical environment. So a lot of times when I talk about data, I start off with a description of this guy here, uh, Billy Bean. You guys all know who he is, mm -hmm. right? What he's famous for? We've had him come and speak here at <coughs> Berkeley uh, to our MBAs. Okay, he has pretty much revolutionized uh, the business of sports, uh, primarily in the area of HR, right? It was about how you hire and recruit and retain people uh, for your team so that your team can outperform uh, the other team, okay? And so the reason why he's famous is because of this book that was written about him. Uh, which was later turned into a movie, and everybody knows, oh yeah, Brad Pitt, okay, we know that. All right, so especially when I'm talking to international people, they don't know anything about baseball, and they say, oh yeah, Brad Pitt, uh, we get it. Okay, so what is it that he did? I mean, here's a person who, um, now he's a sports insider, but he was smart enough to realize that he had to go outside of the world of sports and, and find amateurs, right, these statisticians, to come in and help advise him on making uh, better decisions. And so, you know, what you saw in, in baseball at this time was the replacement of the old decision makers, the ones who relied entirely on gut and instinct right, and experience uh, and replaced them with decision makers that relied on, on data, on evidence, on empirical support, on experimentation, uh, and so forth. So that's really the fundamental change uh, which we're seeing happen in every industry and in every functional area. Now, retailing is one of those areas that's still, I think, dominated to a large extent by this idea of gut. You know, if you think about the buyers, for instance, the buyers of, of merchandise, you know, they rely a lot on experience and, and gut and much less on, on data, partially because their development cycles are so long that they don't have any data. So one of the big challenges is to shorten the development cycle, shorten the decisioning cycle. We may not have time to talk about that, but that, that's really important. So what was Billy Bean able to do through this transition? Uh, he basically created what I think of as HR alpha, meaning if you're familiar with finance, the financial term, alpha represents outperformance, right? So he was able to outperform the other teams that had the same budget, meaning he could play in the big leagues with the New York Yankees with about a third of the payroll. Okay, so look, you can win by adding payroll, or you can win by making better decisions. Okay, he was winning by making better decisions and was able to compete with those that had more resources. And so this, gift, this difference or this gap, right, that's what I call uh, HR alpha, because it was really in the area of HR, right, identifying employees where he was able to outperform. Okay, and so now we talk, of course, about the money ball of everything, the money ball of media, the money ball of education, the money ball of finance, you know, and of course, the money ball of retail. Okay, how many of you have heard that term, money ball of retail? Okay, well, you need to start using that term when you go back to your team uh, and tell them about what you learned here in, in Berkeley. Okay, now it's actually quite simple, uh, you know, and people go, oh, uh, uh, retail, oh, uh, you know, data science, oh, uh, math, oh, uh, I can't deal with it, right? It's actually very simple. You know, I've run one, two, three-day workshops right here in this room where I teach ordinary human beings, right, to do data science. It's not that hard. If you've ever used a spreadsheet, then you know how to do uh, data science. You basically have a bunch of rows and a bunch of columns where a row might represent, for instance, an individual shopper okay, or an individual uh, unit that you have or product. Okay, and then a column is essentially a feature of that individual or a feature of that product where the final column is the thing that you're interested in. So if it's a customer, the final product might be, you know, did the customer buy the product or not? If it's a product, it could be, did this product sell or not? And so all data science is, is collecting a whole bunch of what we call training data, which is historical data, data that's already revealed itself. A product has already revealed itself by either selling or not selling, or a customer has revealed their true nature by either buying or not buying, 
And if I have enough of that training data, then if a customer walks in the store, I should be able to predict, are they going to buy or not buy? Or if a product enters into the store, I should be able to predict, is it going to sell or, or not sell? Okay, and so the, the final row in this database, right, would have some value missing in this cell. And then what I'm doing is I'm doing data science to predict, right, what is going to appear in that cell. Okay, and the better my model, the better the prediction I'm going to make about what's going to happen. And then I can make my decisions based on those predictions. Like, why would I stock something on my shelves that's not going to sell? Why would I promote something to a customer that's not going to buy? Uh, and so on. Okay, so if anybody asks you, right, what is data science? It's just two words, uh, training and scoring, right? So if you have a credit score, then that's right, FICO, training and scoring. They're training on, you know, millions of customers, uh, and then they're, based on that data, you enter in and say, hey, who am I? They score you and say, oh, you're more like the defaulters or you're more like the people who pay their bills by observing all of your characteristics and attributes. So obviously, right, the more rows you have, right, the more individuals that you have in your database, the better your prediction will be, right, uh, and the more columns you have, the more characteristics or features about those individuals, the better your prediction will be, okay? And so, you know, there are a lot of people that, you know, if you're an auto dealer, auto dealers have a algorithm, and the algorithm is, oh, you're a man, you're going to pay less than your woman. So we have two basic features, male or female, and they base it on, you know, they, I've sold 50 cars in my lifetime, and I know males pay more than females. So they have 50 rows, two columns, not a great algorithm, okay? Not a great algorithm. But if we could combine the experience of all those uh, auto dealers and add in plenty of more features besides just, you know, the gender of the customer, then we could get really, really good uh, accurate predictions. But, but here's, here's the thing. These Oakland Athletics, they, they basically had a competitive advantage. That competitive advantage was based on analytics, right? The ability to do this math that no one else was doing. Is this a sustainable competitive advantage? Is it sustainable? Right, so a sustainable competitive advantage is one, you know, where you can actually make, you know, make money, you know, for many, many years. Is it sustainable? Do you have intellectual property? Do you have patents, trademarks, or copyrights built around this capability, this analytical capability? No. So what's to prevent your competitor from doing the same exact thing? Nothing. And this is exactly what happened, right? Their extra performance disappeared because the other teams, the New York Yankees, the Boston Red Sox, the Los Angeles Dodgers, just started copying, right, what the Oakland Athletics were doing. And of course, they had bigger budgets. So analytics plus bigger budgets, Oakland Athletics returned back to mediocrity, right, soon uh, thereafter. Okay, so the key takeaway here is that you cannot, and in retail, you could probably, just by having moderately good analytics, do better than your competitor. But in the long run, that is not something you can build a competitive advantage on. The only thing you can build a true competitive advantage on is, is data, right? Data that you have and that no one else has, right? I'm going to repeat that because this is probably the most important takeaway. The only way that you can build a competitive advantage in today's world is to have right, proprietary data, to have information that no one else has. That's it. Now, okay, you can have a brand that no one else has. Yeah, you know, you can have location that no one else has. But at the end of the day, those things, if they're not generating proprietary data, then you or will be out of business soon, okay? So keep that in mind. This is why companies like Facebook and Google, they just give away all their analytics. They spend billions of dollars developing these tools like facial recognition, and then they just give it away. Why? Because they have data. Google has data that no one else has. Facebook has data that no one else has. As a retailer, what data do you have that no one else has? Think about it, okay? And if you don't have it, you need to start thinking about it. Okay, all right, so uh, I'll give you another example from baseball, and this is uh, the San Francisco Giants right across uh, the bay. Um, they decided to get into the data business. A friend of mine is the CIO there, and what they did is they installed cameras all throughout the outfield. This was their innovation. Why'd they do this? Well, okay, proprietary, what kind of data? 
Well, so what they did is they started tracking the players in the field because you know they had all this. They knew about you know hitting. They knew about pitching. What they didn't know about was fielding, right? And this is a big part of the game. And the reason why is because there were no kind of commonly available statistics that you could insert into a spreadsheet. So they need to start creating new types of statistics. Like, uh, and you'll see now if you watch baseball, they actually have all these crazy like closing speed, angular, angle of ascent, you know, all this crazy stuff that didn't exist before. And so, you know, what you really want to do is have some new statistics and you need to capture some data. So you have cameras that captures data. You have spreadsheets with statistics in them that you can just push a button. So we've learned, I can do that, install a camera with a screwdriver. I can do this, push a button, do my spreadsheet analysis. But the missing piece is how do you convert the data that you capture right, with cameras into data that you can do analytics on? That's the hard part. Because what are you capturing with these cameras? Images, or images statistics. No, right? In fact, if you have, you're just capturing pixels, okay? And so those pixels have to be converted to numbers. So suppose you're just capturing movement. What's the vast majority of the movement that you're capturing? Are you capturing even people? No, you're capturing birds, mostly, <laughs> right? So you actually need to be able to distinguish between birds and people. Okay, now this is where I can't teach you this stuff. Okay, this is where I, this is something that goes beyond like simple data science. This is sometimes called, uh, you know, deep learning or neural networks, stuff like that, right? But it's a type of machine learning. And, you know, if, if, I, get, if I can get you to look at pictures of cats and dogs and hit cat, cat, dog, dog, cat, cat, dog, dog, okay, there exists uh, technology that will just extract from your decisioning, right, an algorithm that will enable it to recognize whether it's looking at a cat or a dog. But we need the humans to provide the tagging or the training data on which this model uh, would, would work. Okay, and so, you know, this is what's called neural nets. Okay, uh, this is big data. So if what Billy Bean was doing is small data, right? Did he hit the ball or not? Okay, you could record that with a pencil. Uh, but if you're trying to figure out like what was the, you know, humans bodily movements and, you know, all that kind of stuff, that requires what we call kind of big data. So big data is, you know, images, uh, uh, you know, sentiment analysis, uh, you know, um, Facebook feeds, you know, Twitter feeds, Instagram feeds, all that other stuff which retailers are now using, right, to try to uh, uh, make predictions. Okay, that's, that's big data. Uh, you guys all know about this? The hot dog, not hot dog app. You've seen this on Silicon Valley. Okay, that is a very, very simple version of machine, uh, machine learning. Okay, so if we take this idea that it's really about the data, but remember these algorithms, they're commonplace. I can get these from Microsoft, Azure Cloud, you know, with the push of a button. Uh, it's not that complicated. The part that's hard is the data. So if I have more pictures of hot dogs than anybody else, my algorithm uh, will be better uh, than anyone else's, even though I'm using the same code to, to generate this classifier. Okay, so who do you think is winning in the automated car race? Google or, or Tesla? Google. Why do you say Google? They have more data because they have more miles. On the no, no, they no. don't, in fact. They have, <coughs> they have better technicians. They have better <coughs> um, uh, machine learning experts. They have better software, better algorithms. The one thing they don't have is more data. Who's got more data? Tesla. Why? <coughs> Because, you know, they have about 100 of these cars rolling around in Sunnyvale, whereas Tesla has, right, uh, uh, tens of thousands of cars driving around at all times, uh, hoovering up uh, data because every single Tesla is connected to the internet at all times, and it has hundreds of sensors that are putting data up into the cloud, which is being analyzed and harvested, right, by Tesla to generate autonomous uh, driving algorithms. So they have weak algorithms, strong data. Who's going to win? Tesla until Google can figure out how to start capturing uh, more, more data, okay? So look, entire occupations will disappear, like, right, doctors who are looking at MRIs and saying, you know, cancer, no cancer, or human and Bart Simpson, right? It's, it's, it's about, um, <coughs> or is that Homer? That's Homer, right? So as long as you have a human going, you know, cancer, no cancer, cancer, no cancer, we can replace that with a robot. Okay, now think about what the humans do in any kind of uh, retail environment. You know, someone comes in the store and they're like, okay, I'm gonna sell to this person versus that person, right? Basing it on some intuition that they have. We can automate that whole thing, right? If we have enough uh, training data. But it's not just the decisioning, but the actual 
right, um, acting on those decisions. So, you know, the surgeons, uh, if we have enough data on surgeons and how they operate and how they engage in surgery, like clip here, don't clip here, you know, sew here, so don't sew here, we can replace the surgeons with, with robots. And I'm sure this will happen uh, very soon. It won't be that uh, far away. Okay, but again, these machines aren't very good at everything. We still need some humans. Uh, the, the, the AI can't do this, right? You, your brain is doing stuff that your four-year-old can do stuff that the AI can't do here. Or, or this one, I love this one. This is one of my favorites. <coughs> so, you know, yeah. Uh, your your, your, your two-year-old will not take a bite out of the puppy, right, thinking it's chicken. But the computer will. Okay, but just to finish, I'm almost I'm wrapping up with sports. Um, you know, now in addition to right, using cameras, we can also use things like, like sensors. Uh, and if we put sensors on the bodies of the athletes, and most of our NFL players have sensors in their shoulder pads, we have sensors in the ball, and the NFL is hoovering up all this data, and it's actually, you don't know what to do with it, right? But these are different ways of, of data capture. So what we're talking about here is big data, okay? And what is big data? This is from Dan Ariely. Big data is like teenage sex. Everybody talks about it. Nobody knows how to do it. Everybody thinks everyone else is doing it. So everyone claims they're doing it. Okay? So uh, I don't know where you work, but I'm willing to bet that uh, your CEO has a big data strategy when he's talking to journalists, right? Or she's talking to journalists. They say, oh yeah, we got a big data strategy. Oh yeah, yeah. And what does it mean? It means they're spending a lot of money with IBM or somebody. It doesn't mean they actually have a strategy. Okay? You need to have a strategy, and the strategy cannot be spend a lot of money. It has to be very conscious. What is the data you're capturing? Why are you capturing it? What are you doing with it? How do you store it? How do you retrieve it? How do you analyze it? Right? How does it affect the actual business problems that you face in your daily lives from marketing, finance, accounting, operations, etc.? So, you know, when we're talking about big data, it's really all about these three things, variety, velocity, and, and volume. And just to give you an example, think back to that spreadsheet. How big is Amazon's spreadsheet? So they have a row in their database for every individual. So Aaron, how many products have you bought from Amazon in your lifetime? Probably 5,000. 5,000, okay. All right, that's, that seems about right. I've probably <laughs> bought many times more than that, but still, that's good. That means that in addition to you being a row and everyone in this room being a row, that means you have 5,000 columns that represent all the items that you've purchased. But that's not all, because how many items have you not purchased from Amazon? Millions. Millions. So they need a column for each one of those as well. So in your row, it lists all the things you've purchased and all the things you haven't purchased. But not only that, it also tracks what are the things that you put in your basket and then removed from your basket. What are the things that you looked at, you did a search for, but then you never actually put in your basket? What was the price of the product when you purchased it? And what was the price of the product that you didn't purchase when you didn't purchase it? Okay, Those are all things that are stored in Amazon's database. This is why Amazon invented AWS, is to essentially store the massive amount of data that they have. I, I work with Alibaba, and uh, you know, they have 750 million customers. So that's 750 million rows. And then think about all the columns that they have. This is why they invented the Ali Cloud, right? To essentially store all of this information. So look, when Amazon acquired Whole Foods, right? There was a, a, all the retail stocks in America crashed, uh, right? And Amazon, actually, the stock went up by more that day than the amount of the purchase. So why was Amazon stock going up? Do you think it's because they're going to make money from, from uh, Whole Foods? Well, they probably will. I mean, you know, Whole Foods was very primitive. They didn't have a loyalty program. They didn't have a pricing strategy. Their sourcing and their logistics was terrible. Amazon's going to fix all that. But even if they don't make any money from Whole Foods. It, it's like the Soviet Union acquiring a warm water Yeah. Well, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether that's, I, I'm not sure I follow that analogy, but I think. Uh, <laughs> I'm just saying, right, it's like, you have this giant retail force, and the the uh, the warm water port is essentially the storefront, right? All of a sudden, they acquire this massive new storefront. Mm. No, I don't think that's it. I think it's more like I'm selling fire insurance, okay, and I just burn somebody's house down, right? Because what this means is that every single retailer in America said, "Oh crap, we need." 
a data, we need a data strategy. We need a cloud strategy, right? If we want to compete. And where are they going to go for their cloud services? AWS, right? And so, you know, Kroger's like, crap, we don't know anything about our customers. We don't know anything about our products. We don't know anything about our supply chain. You know, we need to hire some data scientists and we need to hire some, you know, uh, data storage people. And uh, we better start putting all this stuff in the cloud. Let's go hire AWS, right? It doesn't matter that they're a competitor, right? Netflix keeps their data with Amazon. They're, they're a competitor. CIA keeps their data with Amazon. Everybody keeps their data with, with Amazon, okay? So it's really all about... Right, the volume. What about velocity? Velocity is another thing. This is the speed with which you can do your compute. In our world, we're used to you know, sending an inquiry out to a data team and asking for a report. Yeah, what was sales in Kansas last month? It's like, oh, well, and, you know, 48 hours later, you get a little spreadsheet from some, some gnome that lives in you know, the basement of the building that's you know, vitamin D deficient, right? <clears throat> you can't operate like that anymore. I mean, imagine if a Tesla is cruising down the road and it sees some object and it's like, paper bag or bag lady? <laughs> hmm. Right? And so it sends the inquiry to an analyst. It says, you know, let me know what you think. And the analyst is like, mm -hmm, you know, let me put it in the queue, like wait until I'm done some other projects and I get to it later. You look at it, mm -hmm, I don't know, it looks like an old lady. And you send it back to the car, you know, a week later. You can't do that. It has to be processed in microseconds, in milliseconds, right? The minute you open up your laptop and you punch in Amazon.com, what happens is Amazon decides at that moment what to show you, right? What website to show you, how it looks. And it looks different every time you log in. And it's going to look different based on, right, you know, where you are, what you've done, you know, all this stuff. You know, Facebook's newsfeed is adapted on the fly in real time. So this is velocity. You have to be able to decision fast, okay? And then variety, what kind of data are we talking about? We're not just talking about purchase data, price data, location data, right? Text data, sentiment data, all this stuff is gonna have to be. And then is the data accurate? Okay, that's another question. So what are some applications? So I teach in a lot of different areas here at Berkeley, and I teach a course, on, I've taught a course on pricing. And pricing to me is the easiest way to make money. I mean, it is the absolute one easiest way. If you're gonna do an intervention, if you came to me, and asked me to do some consulting and he said I want a quick win I just want to like you know make some money uh, without really doing much to alter my fundamental underlying business I would say pricing let's take a look at your pricing because my guess is that your pricing is, 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 is crap okay because it is crap for most businesses now what about an airline what do they do why does the airline price vary for a ticket you know every minute of, of every day Right? What's going on? They've been doing this for, you know, 30 years. If you, went to, if you asked Robert Crandall, the, the, the head of American Airlines, in, in 1990, he would have said, I run a technology company. I run a software company that just so happens to own these flying tin cans. And if I could get rid of these flying tin cans, I would. Because I don't want them. They're, they're expensive. They're finicky. Like, they're, it's a hassle. Right? But I make all my money from the software. Okay, I make all my money from my pricing algorithm. If American Airlines ditched its pricing algorithm, they would start losing money and disappear off the face of the earth. So why do they change their prices every minute of every day? <clears throat> it's because the elasticity of demand is changing at all times. All right? So first of all, you have real-time supply data on how many seats you have in inventory. You have real-time supply data of all your customer, all your competitors. And then you have this real-time demand data. How many people are logging on right now? Okay. But you also have predictive analytics. Predictive analytics says, if I cut my price today, then I'm going to steal customers, not just from my competitors, but I'm going to steal customers from tomorrow. Right? You know, when you look at Macy's and you look at, you know, white sales and up and down sales and everything, do you think they have a really good sense of how many of these customers that bought during the white sale, you know, would have bought the same exact product the next day, you know, if it weren't on sale today? Do you think they have good data on that? Do you think they really, now they're getting better. Macy's is getting way better than it used to be, but that's just not, right, something that's in the DNA of, of a typical retailer. They're just like, well, you know, people love white sales. They're, yep, you know, that's how they operate, right? <coughs> so. The airlines are, are using algorithms, predictive analytics, to do this. San Francisco Giants, they moved from fixed pricing to variable pricing about 10 years ago. 
They went from six price points to 6,000 price points overnight through the use of software. Okay? What happened? So first of all, why, why would the price, and so the price varies in real time. You can log on, same seat, changes prices day to day. Why, why would they do this? Elasticity, yeah, you're good. The elasticity of demand changes. <laughs> what causes what causes the elasticity of demand to change? In that case, I guess who they're playing again. Who they're playing? The right. So look, there's weekday, weekend, day, night, but then those are known ahead of time. Who you're playing, okay, the quality of the opponent will change over time. Beginning of the season you think the Yankees are good, end of the season they suck, right? Uh, you might be like in the competitive race at the end of the season, in which case you can charge higher prices. What about the weather? What about player injuries? All of these things cause the prices to change. And so the San Francisco Giants, they use an algorithm that guarantees that the final seat is sold one third of the way into every game. So that means there's always seats available until inning three. Okay? Now, what's the net impact on the business? 30% 30, 30 increase in revenue. 30% increase in revenue. Okay, without any fundamental change in the business. Prior to this, Half the games had empty seats. Half the, half the time, the, 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 the game was sold out and the tickets were selling in the secondary market and the, 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 the scalpers were, were earning all the profit. Since they did this, they have sold out every single game with a 30% increase in revenue. Now, what does that translate into? Three world championships. Okay? Why did they win three world championships? And you go, well, you know, they hired this coach, they drafted this shortstop. No, it's because of dynamic pricing. Okay, plus the field affects cameras in the outfield. Okay, that's what did it. So, let's take a look at these three companies. Amazon, this is from 2011. That's when I put this slide into my uh, class for the first time. Okay, and this is, this is, my invest, this is how I invest my money. I, I, do, I look at my slides. Okay, so there are three companies here. There are three companies here. There's Amazon, Best Buy, and Sears. And what the Wall Street Journal did is they tracked a single microwave oven over a 24-hour cycle. <coughs> Amazon, nine price changes. Best Buy, two price changes. Sears, zero price changes. <coughs> so, which company is bankrupt? Sears. Which company has seen its stock go up 10x since this slide was produced? Amazon, okay? So, why does Amazon change the price by $200 at 6 p.m.? Yes, <laughs> right. People ha are more price sensitive after 6 p.m. than before. Now, why? Does Amazon care why? They don't care why. They're not sociologists. They're not, econ they, they're not writing journal articles you know, for this. They could care less. All they know is that for some reason, People aren't price sensitive before 6 p.m. Now, it could be that, like, you know, you're rushing to get out of work and you're like, oh, shoot, I got to catch the bus. Damn, I got to get that microwave oven or my, my wife or husband's going to kill me. So, you know, you click the button. Okay. Remember, this is before phones, 2011. It wasn't a big phone thing. Uh, then you get home and you're like, whew, oh, dang, I got to buy that microwave oven. All right, you crack, crack open a beer, you start shopping around, you know, whatever. We don't know. We don't care. Because how does Amazon know that the price elasticity of demand has changed? Well, remember, if you held your price fixed all day long, you wouldn't know that the price elasticity has changed. There's only one way to find out. Right. You vary the price. You do experimentation. Right? So they do about three, this is an old slide, they do about five million price changes a day. Five million price changes a day. Okay, and if you look, look on your basket, you'll see, this is just, you know, every day I open my basket, and it shows me all the things in my basket, the prices have changed. And this happens, you know, maybe fi every five minutes they'll change some of the prices of some of the items that are in uh, the basket. Okay, now look, we know about Uber, we know about dynamic pricing, same idea here. This has made dynamic pricing uh, mainstream. And the goal of Uber, effectively, is to control, have constant service quality in a world with variable demand. Now, a taxi cab provides constant price variable service quality, right? So sometimes, you know, you wait 20 minutes for a cab, sometimes you wait one minute for a cab, and the price is the same. With Uber, typically the wait's four minutes or so, but the price varies based on variability of supply and demand. Okay, so you can choose one or you can choose the other, but you can't choose both, right? So you, that's, a, that's a design decision. What are you, you're designing the experience 
and, and you know, in general, I think most people would prefer constant service quality, especially if you're interested in branding, right? You want constant service quality. And the only way you can do that in a world of variable supply, variable demand, is to have a variable price. Okay, yeah. Yeah. How will that impact the Yeah. That's a great, you great don't question. Have infinite, infinite number of products. Yeah. That's where they're paying more attention. Yeah. Think they're more sensitive. So I think a lot of it has to do with like have you already invested time and effort in getting to the store and then you have like unpleasant surprises or pleasant surprises. You know, then you're gonna be pissed off. Right? Whereas with Uber, it's like you can just open it up and say, okay, do I want the Uber or not? So here, this is a, a time slice of Uber data over a, a short period of time uh, in Madison Square Garden. So Ariana Grande concert was letting out. And what we see is the number of people who opened up their Uber app immediately when the concert was over, you know, surged. But the number of people who actually ordered Ubers, right, was, was much smaller. Now, before the concert, they were the same. Everybody who opened Uber got an Uber. These guys opened up the Uber. They saw the price, and they're like, you know what? I'm going to take the subway, right? And so what you're doing is you're allocating the goods to those who, who need them the most or have the highest willingness to pay, unlike a taxi where it, it's allocated to the people with the biggest elbows, right? And that, that creates a nasty experience if people have to elbow each other aside. So, you know, I think it's very important that this is not something you'd want to do in every business, okay? Uh, but, um, you know, think about Instacart. Anybody here use Instacart? They use variable pricing for deliveries. So it's like, okay, I want my groceries at 6 p.m. Well, that's going to cost me $5. If I'm willing to take them at 7 p.m., it's free. If I take them at 8 p.m., Instacart will pay me. Okay? So there it's like, you know, what's the customer satisfaction there? Uh, you know, part of it's like, well, you want to pay $5? But it's like, look, you don't have to do it. It's like, I don't have to fly on United you know, the day before Thanksgiving. Like, we expect to pay more the day before Thanksgiving. Okay, so a lot of it's also about consumer expectations. Uh, and those things are endogenous, right? You can, you can manage the expectations of, of the consumer. Okay, so, you know, electricity pricing. This is AWS cloud services pricing. Again, this is, you know, B2B, so it's a little bit less, you know, a concern. Uh, congestion pricing on, uh, this is the Beltway in Washington, D.C. Okay, you know, again, there's a free lane. So if you don't, you don't like this congestion pricing, then you can pay with your time. You have a choice. You want to pay with time, you want to pay with money. It's up to you. Okay? So giving people choice is always good. And we're doing this with parking here in San Francisco. It used to be a flat fee. Now it's variable by time. Now this is not dynamic because it's fixed ahead of time. Uh, so you know, we have variable pricing and parking meters. But you know what? San Francisco is actually moving to a fully dynamic pricing model for parking meters uh, in the next couple years, which means that you don't actually know how much you're going to pay until you, you know, get out of the car and then look at, oh, $100 an hour, like, whoa, forget that. So one way to manage those expectations is to have an app. And so you have an app which tells you, look on, oh, man, pricing in downtown San Francisco is pretty bad today. I think I'm going to take an Uber, right? So I think if you communicate it, like if I knew ahead of time before I went to my North Face, that, oh, man, they only got three of those jackets left and you know, they're, they're priced at double, 2x today, uh, I'll save it for another day. You know, let the people who are about to embark on their camping trip go get it. I'll, I can wait a week. So a lot of it's about managing expectations. But we can also charge different prices based on your location. Now, we do this in retail all the time, bricks and mortar retail. What about online retail? We can do it here too. I can charge, if you're living, for instance, in a rich neighborhood, I can charge you more online. If you live close to a store, I can charge you less. How do I know where you are? <clears throat> How do I know where you are in the bricks and mortar world? You're in the store. How do I know where you are in the online world? IP address. So I read your IP address and then I charge you a different price based on your location. Okay, and you know, this is true. Germans and French spent diff had different prices for, uh, for Disneyland. Uh, why? Nobody likes Germans anyway, right? So it's like, yeah, charge them more money, right? Keep them away from, from Disneyland, okay? Again, IP address, you can use that. Again, why? Because Different elasticity of demand, right? Uh, so this is uh, the, the New Zealand uh, rugby, uh, uh, rugby team, the All Blacks. 
So they charge $104 on a US website, $220 on a New Zealand website. Why? Exactly. Now, the New Zealand people were pissed off. And so Adidas said, I love this, cost difference is due to currency fluctuations. <laughs> okay, that's your PR team at work. Because that's total crap. That's total nonsense. Right? It has nothing to do with that. Otherwise, they would you know, go flip around. Okay, this is, again, in the US, a black shirt is a black shirt. It's like Raiders, all blacks, you know, I don't care. In New Zealand, it's like, no, those are not substitutes. <clears throat> now, we've been doing this in the bricks and mortar world for a long time. Different prices for, for different people. Okay? You know, I remember I used to take my girlfriend's blouses down to the dry cleaner, and they'd be like, oh, $6. And I'd say, no, 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 this is not a blouse. This is a shirt. Say, oh, $2. But they would be like, what? Well, it's got ruffles on it. It's like, yeah, you know, hey, I like ruffles, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we've been doing this a long time. Uh, but in bricks and mortar, I can actually, you know, look at you and, and, and figure out, like, how, how, who are you? How do I price differently to you? I can drill it down the individual. This is my favorite example, uh, you know, of, of bricks and mortar price discrimination, right? <laughs> you, you guys seen this? Right? It's, it's, this happens. So, so look, some of these algorithms can get out of control. So if you use an algorithm to price your product based on kind of all these inputs that you're tracking through data, you can get some crazy stuff. So this is a book on Amazon that was selling for about uh, $23 million. Okay, why was this book selling for $23 million? Good book. <laughs> no, hardly. <laughs> what? No, so I think it's hard to say, but I think the algorithm for one of these guys was charge like 20% more than the competitor. And this one was like charge, you know, 15% less than the competitor. And so you basically had this feedback loop, which took the prices, you know, through, through the roof. Okay. And so you see this kind of crazy stuff happening. We can also charge differentially based on your browser type or your computer. How many of you have apples? Okay. You're paying more than the people with, uh, with Windows. Right? That's why I have windows here. This, this saves me a ton of money. <coughs> okay, now look, they're not necessarily charging you a different price, but they're, they're directing you to a different menu of products. So their recommendation engine is, is pushing different products, okay, based on your browser type. And Jeff Bezos actually experimented with uh, giving people individual pricing. Based on your individual characteristics, you get an individual price. And this, this caught, now this caused a lot of backlash, and so they had to backtrack uh, away from that. Okay, so this brings up kind of, I think, what, what everybody know, everybody's heard this story about Target. You guys all heard this story about Target? Yeah. Okay, this is like the Adam and Eve story for, for retail, for modern retail. Like, if you haven't heard this story, you, you darn well, you know, better memorize it. Uh, because, you know, this happened back in 2011, I think it was, and uh, this, this, this girl, uh, this father was going through his mail one day, and he saw these coupons for diapers for his 17-year-old daughter. Okay, and so uh, he was pissed off. He went down to the local Target, said to the store manager, like, what the hell are you doing sending diaper coupons to my daughter? You know, she's 17 years old. <laughs> and the store manager's like, <clears throat> sorry about that, man. I really apologize, et cetera, et cetera. Here's some free coupons, whatever. Not for diapers. And so, <clears throat> so the guy went home. He told his family. He said, you know, I really talked to that guy. Uh, and uh, the daughter's like, but dad, I am pregnant. <laughs> so the question is, how did Target know that she was pregnant before her own father. Okay, so you're, you're, you're pretty new school. So, you know, when I, when I talk to, to my MBAs, they're like, uh, she's dating the store manager? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, that, that's, that's like old school IT, right? Old school business analytics, business intelligence. No, is yeah, exactly right. It had to do with her purchasing history, right? What was she purchasing? So they have an algorithm actually at Target says, if you buy this basket of goods, you're probably going to be buying diapers from us soon. And if we can get in and get you started on the diaper subscription model, you know, early on, then we, you won't go to Walmart. Okay. So it's an algorithm. It's a predictive algorithm using predictive analytics where the training data is previous customers. Okay. Now how do they know what she purchased? Yeah, loyalty program. So if it was a bricks and mortar thing, and we've been using these for decades, right? How many of you have a Safeway card? Right, we all have Safeway cards. Okay, what does Safeway do with this data? Nothing. Nothing, right? They don't do much with it. They're not that, pr they're pretty primitive, right? But other companies like Target, they do this, right? They use loyalty scheme data, okay? Uh, and if you buy online, of course, you know, then you have to register and you have to have an online ID. 
Okay. Now, one of the challenges is that a lot of these companies, they have online identifiers and they have bricks and mortar identifiers and they don't stitch them together. And so you have multiple individuals in your database that's the same person. Okay. And so your predictions are, are not very good. But look, if you log in, that's, that's good. And by the way, Walmart does not have a loyalty scheme and yet they know who you are. How do they know who you are? Credit card. So if you use a credit card, they have good predictive models that will tie you together. Even if you use multiple credit cards, they'll stitch you together based on your location, based on the purchases, based on the cards that you're using, etc. So it's actually, uh, you, you don't even need to have a loyalty scheme anymore uh, nowadays. Uh, and even if people pay with cash, a lot of times they'll say, hey, what's your email address? Right? And then they'll use that to stitch back into the, the database. Okay, now once you know this, once you have right, the individual, uh, you have a, a database, you have a row that tracks all of the individual purchases and all the individual searches and so forth, what can you do? You can start offering customized, individualized recommendations. And this is what Netflix has been doing right, for, for decades. Uh, well, not decades, but you know, close to two decades. They're providing individual recommendations. Now, now look, in the old days, right, if, you went into, if your grandparents went into a retailer, just, just think about it. Your grandparent walks into a retailer, a grocery store. The merchant would be like, oh, hey, uh, Mr. Hassan. You know, we've got these wonderf uh, wonderful new like vet zucchinis. You know, we know how much you love zucchinis. <clears throat> and you'd be like, oh, thank you, blah, 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 right? And they would have this wonderful one-to-one -one relationship where the retailer would actually know you. I remember when I lived in Paris, I'd walk into the wine merchant. And they'd be like, bonjour, monsieur, blah, blah, blah. You know, I got this burgundy for you, special, whatever, right? <clears throat> Then we went through the dark ages of retail. And the dark ages of retail is you walk into a store and you browse the shelves and you grab something and you walk to the counter and there's some kid chewing gum. He's like, blah, blah. thank you, Mr. Hassan. You know, and then you walk off with the goods. Okay, we are returning to the old days where every customer is a distinct individual with a distinct history, a distinct pattern of preferences, where we as a, as a retailer can provide them with, with customized, individualized advice. So we don't say, oh, you know, this item's popular. We say, this is what you're gonna like, right? And how do we do it? Right, and Amazon does it, right? You can go to, your, go to somebody's Amazon page and you can learn everything you need to know about them, right? So this is, this is my page, uh, which is, you know, Clark would be happy to see that the bottom row is all design books and the top row is all data science books. So I remember when I was a kid in college, I'd go to, if I wanted to go, if I was going on a date with, with a girl, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of sneak into her house and look at her bookshelf to see, you know, what I was getting into, right? <clears throat> now you, you can't do that. You got to hack into their Amazon account, right? And, and see, you know, who they are. And all you have to do is look at their recommendation page and you know everything there is to know about that person. So what they're doing is it's very simple data science. It's called um, collaborative filtering. And there's two ways to do it. One is what I call the Pandora model, which is uh, item-based filtering, where you know, I, 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 the things that you've purchased, I have uh, kind of a, a identifier. So Pandora does this. Uh, you, know, you listen to a piece of music and they're like, okay, it's uh, Latin music, a female singer, uh, you know, a syncopated beat. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, came out in the 80s. You know, you have all those different characteristics and then you look for things that have similar characteristics. <clears throat> this is actually a very expensive way to do things because people have to listen to the music and so forth. The other way to do it, which is much easier, is the, is the Netflix method where they don't actually record any of the characteristics of the items. Instead, what they do is they record the characteristics of the consumer. And they don't record the demographics of the consumer, they report, record only the purchase history of the consumer. Okay, so it's not like, oh, female 18 to 35. It's like you're a series of ones and zeros and they go out and look for other people that have similar ones and zeros and then look for mismatches and then do cross promotion that way. Okay, it's extraordinarily effective. It's also very, very computationally easy. Um, you know, you have a lot of data to deal with, but it's, it's a simple algorithm. And so a recommendation, the ideal recommendation, if you, you, you know all this, I'm sure, is not something that they're never going to buy and it's not something they're going to buy anyway. Right? So if somebody bought Harry Potter Volume 1, Amazon will not say, hey, you really, they're not going to send you an email suggesting Harry Potter Volume 2. 
It's like if you buy some heroin off me, I don't need to send you an email, right, and, you know, encouraging you to buy more heroin, right? I know it's, it sells itself. So I want to recommend something to you that you wouldn't otherwise purchase because your attention span is, is, is limited, okay? And I do this through experimentation. So, so look, the real challenge we have now is we've got bricks and mortar retailers that, that really haven't kind of, they can't do a lot of the things that you can do with online retail. It's so much easier when you're dealing with online customers. When you're dealing with bricks and mortar, it's the data capture piece that's harder, it's the, the decisioning that's harder, and then it's the implementation uh, that's, that's, that's so hard. But there are some retailers that have moved towards dynamic pricing. So this is actually Tesco in the UK. They did an experiment with dynamic pricing. You know, why would you sell beer, for instance, at midnight for the same price as 10 a.m. if you're a grocery store? It makes absolutely no sense at all. <coughs> so if we could do that, and you can control this from a central headquarters, uh, if you have this kind of uh, digital price displays, then you can do this. Of course, Amazon Go does this uh, in their retail store. Um, but, you know, digitally on, online, I, I have, uh, initially all I have is purchase data. But purchase data is so limited. What if I could capture data after the point of sale? Now this is what we can do when we sell digital products. If I sell you a physical book, all I know is that you bought it. I don't know that you read it. But if you buy a Kindle book, I know if you read it, when you read it, where you read it, how many times you read it, in how many intervals. Okay, I can know that you read it while you were commuting on the BART every morning, okay? Now, this is incredibly powerful data. If I'm Spotify, I know that you listen to a song 50 times, right, and then stopped listening to it. I don't know that if you buy the CD, okay? Magazines. I remember talking to the head of uh, marketing for Condé Nast, and he was like, oh, I don't want anybody to know who looks at the ads. They'd be horrified. Nobody looks at the ads. It's like, you're insane, right? People are going to figure that out. You want to be able to show them that they've looked at the ads and, and read the product. Why does Netflix no longer ask you to rate your movies? It already knows. It already knows. How does it know? Did you watch it all the way through? Yes. So you could say, oh, man, Adam Sandler, psh, one star. Yeah, why'd you watch it eight times? <laughs> right? We know that you're lying, right? So look, what we call revealed preferences are always better than stated preferences as an economist because people lie. People also fail to record these things. So that's why we have, for instance, connected pill boxes that tell you whether people took their pills, okay, and so forth. You know, we have connected smart meters so we can capture how much uh, data. This is what I call deep data. It goes past the point of purchase. It actually starts tracking, right, behavior and so forth. And so in the store, what can we do? Because we're at a disadvantage if we're bricks and mortar retailers. Online retailers have all this what we call click data. How can we capture what we might call click data, right? Which is like, you know, the equivalent of click data in a bricks and mortar environment, right? I know if you put something in your basket. What happens if you put something in your basket in a retail environment and then put it back on the shelf or, or leave it in the, 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 you know, the dressing room? You, you try it on, you're like, eh, and then you put it and you just leave it on the bench. How do we know that, right? Do we track this? Right, what if, you know, promotions and sales, how could we promote things to you, right, <clears throat> at the moment of purchase, rather than, you know, we, if we send you an email and then you go to the store a week later, right, well, we want to get you right at the moment of decisioning. This is what online merchants can do. So we want to start capturing data. How many of you capture data in your retail environment? <clears throat> okay, so, you know, what do you use? You can use cameras. Walmart's a big proponent of cameras. They use cameras. People take, you know, the Cheerios off the shelf and then they put it back on the shelf. The cameras can capture that, okay? Beacons. Beacons are incredibly useful, okay? Beacons give you micro-location data, right? So they can track how you move through the store. And there's two ways to do it. One is anonymous, where you just sort of track. Uh, by the way, how are they doing this? What are they tracking? Your phone, right? And is tracking a phone the same as tracking a person? You betcha. Because who doesn't have a phone nowadays? Okay, maybe some infants. That's about it. Everybody has a phone. Okay? But that's still anonymous. But we can also do individual personalized tracking where we tie it to you as the individual customer if we can get them to download an app. Okay? 
So, you know, we've got Wi-Fi networks, we've got beacons, we've got video cameras, etc. Okay, and this is there's a startup called Retail Next. Uh, there's a whole bunch of startups in this space, many of whom have Haas connections, right? Digital Mortar is one, Retail Next is another, Percolata is another. These are all startups. There's dozens of startups in this space that can uh, take this data and, and do it for, you know, real-time tracking, predictive analytics. You can predict floor tr uh, foot traffic, uh, you know, et cetera. Verizon sells a product that'll tell you all the people that walked in front of your store, right? What was their demographics? Males, females, old, young, rich, poor, homeowners, renters, you know, foreign, international, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what kind of phone did they have? What browsers do they use? What apps do they have? All this stuff you can get from Verizon, for instance. Okay, so your phone is continually spitting out all of this, this data which the retailers can use. You know, if I go to, you go to your Google site, you can see they track where you go. This is Facebook. This is me, right? Just a typical day in my life. You know, start at Haas. Oh, traffic jam, you can tell. Okay, go down here. Okay, that's LinkedIn headquarters. Um, Google headquarters, uh, Facebook headquarters, uh, ooh, okay, wine merchant, that's good to know. Facebook, what's Facebook going to do with that information? Hmm, I wonder what. Well, oh, spend a couple hours at the opera. Hmm, I wonder what Facebook's going to do with that, right? Facebook knows where you are in the macro level. Facebook doesn't know what, which aisle of the store you're in. For that, you need something else. Okay, then this location tracking can be used for all sorts of things. Credit card companies are using it for fraud detection to make sure that you are sitting in the restaurant when you ordered the food uh, and so forth. Okay, so this is a product, right, from Retail Next that'll tell you, right, where is the heat map of your sales? Okay, so, you know, what areas are people, uh, you know, maybe you're not selling anything in aisle three because aisle three, if, aisle, if the products in aisle three were in aisle seven, maybe you would have sold them. You, know, you have people that are continually going to this aisle to get you know, the meat and then going over here to get the horseradish, okay? And maybe we could figure out a way to put the horseradish closer to the meat or you know, put some stuff in between that they're likely to pick up on their way to the horseradish, okay? And so you know, we can map the journey, the customer journey in the store, okay? And figure out ways to optimize this or to make it, you know, do we want it to be more efficient or less efficient for the customer? Sometimes we want to build in inefficiencies right, to prompt purchases. I have a friend who works at the Art Institute of Chicago, and the curators outlined a, a, a path that you're supposed to take through the exhibit, and they found through the beacons that everybody was, not, was disobeying the, 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 the curator's instructions. And so they just put in a few, they rearranged the walls to kind of force people to do what the curator wanted them to do. Okay, and we can break it down again. Males, females. The females are going to aisle three. The males are going to aisle four. The old people are hitting the you know the the depends undergarments aisle, right? You know maybe it's something we already knew, uh, you know, but etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can do this for malls, etc. We can also even provide the individual salesperson with assistance, right? So that when someone comes in the store, right, you know who they are, what they've purchased, what they like, and, and so forth. Okay, and so you can also track, this is, um, uh, which is this, uh, uh, what's the company here? Percolata. Percolata will actually tell you, right, which uh, salespeople to assign to which customers uh, based on their prior experiences, their prior track record for selling, and so forth. Okay, so then you can back this into your, your hiring. I'll just give you a few more examples because, you know, Starbucks, do you realize that more transactions happen on the Starbucks app than through... Um, through the Apple Pay? It's crazy, right? Why is this such a popular app? How many people use this app? They can tr so it's great for you because it makes life easy, but it's great for Starbucks because they know all the traffic through the store. They know how long it took you to stand in line to buy your coffee, right? They know how long it took for you to wait for that, that mo mochaccino on the other end, okay? And they can use this data right, to measure customer satisfaction or how long you took the free Wi-Fi, right, how long you spent in the restroom, right, that's an important thing to know if you're Starbucks. Uh, and we can also use it for staffing, right, because we can bake this into our, our hiring algorithm and then tell, you know, where we're overstaffed, when we're understaffed, and even give, right, workers real-time instructions, like move out, stop making coffee, start working the register through texts that are automated based on real-time data that's coming in from, from our apps. Okay, so one word, Amazon Go. That's two words, right? They're doing all of this. Smart shelving, blah, blah, blah. So look, here's one final point I'll make because I've got to wrap up. Who are the most successful bricks and mortar retailers right now? 
the ones that started online. Warby Parker, their sales per square foot is 5x that of a traditional eyeglass store. They started online and they moved into bricks and mortar. So, you know, the bricks and mortar eyeglass business has been around for a century. They thought, we'll disrupt this by going online. Then they're like, let's go bricks and mortar. Now, you'd think that if they moved into bricks and mortar, they would be faced with all the same constraints that a bricks and mortar company had. Why are they able to just totally kick the ass of all the incumbent bricks and mortar eyeglass stores? But why didn't the bricks and mortar people do this? Because they're eye doctors, not retailers. Well, no, they're not eye doctors. They may have eye doctors attached. They are retailers. It's just that they never thought of asking the types of questions that Warby Parker was asking. Like, who is this person that just came in the store? What do they like? What do they want? How many items of inventory should we have based on our expected demand? Right? When a customer comes in, what do they look at? You know, what do they look at and reject? What do they look at and buy? How many items do they look at before they make a purchase? Right? Those are just questions that every retailer would want to know. And, and yet, the typical traditional retailer just didn't even you know, think to ask it. Or it was fragmented industry and they're like, ah. Because when Warby Parker got into this space, they realized the technology wasn't there. They have a simple question. The question couldn't be answered using existing technology. So they actually built out the technology that enabled them to answer these questions. Yeah. So just something to add to that. Um, I already have a profile. Already already yes. So they do omni-channel well. They do omni-channel well, right? So you know you could even open up a website that loses money, and it can help you build out your bricks and mortar retail. Because when they're deciding what inventory to have in you know the zip code 94704, they have a database of customers that live in 94704, and they know what they like. Okay. So you know you're harvesting data from data that you've collected. This proprietary data. Who else has that data? Nobody. Okay, and that's how they're able to drive. So look, I could spend all day on inventory management, on sourcing and supply, right, and how that supply chain has been completely disrupted, the operations piece is completely disrupted, but I just wanted to leave you with this, I'll give you one conclusion here, eye tracking, blah, 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 this is, oh, I love this, this is, you know, when you go to the, 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 the mini bar, I was in a hotel recently, and, and I took the, the, the beverages out so I could put my um, doggy bag in, the next morning, I grabbed the doggy bag out, and I went to check out, and they were like, you know, six martinis. I'm like, what are you talking about? They use sensors, right? So smart shelving, smart checkout, all this stuff, smart inventory management. This is, this is disrupting the business. Okay, so I just want to leave you with one takeaway, uh, which is, oh, all right, I'll give you this one example. I just love this example, because I'm late for my, my, my class. But, <coughs> you know, when you go to Google, and you type in something like Chinese food, for me, I get, this is what I get. I get Chengdu style restaurant. They know I like Chinese, they know I like uh, Szechuan, and they know that I'm in the area, okay? Because that's me up there, I'm registered. They know who I am. And so I would tell my class, you know, in 2007 when I would log into Google and type in Chinese restaurant, they would just give me a Wikipedia entry. Every single person who types in Chinese restaurant gets a different result based on their profile. And people are like, no, that can't be true. No way. You know, that can't be true. So I was like, all right, let's try Baidu. Baidu knows nothing about me. They have no history. I've never used it. I type in Chinese restaurant to Baidu. What do they give me? Wikipedia entry. Because they don't know me. So the more you know your customer, the better. And so oh, where's the la final takeaway slide? The final takeaway slide is this one. There's 10 commandments in retail. And they can all be put onto the tablets, Moses tablets. And he's got Samsung tablets, just so you know. <clears throat> and they are, they're all the same. Uh, know your customer. And the more you know your customer, right, the, the better you will do, okay? But there's lots to it. You gotta capture the right data. You gotta have the right analytics team in place that can analyze that data. And then you have to have the right decisioning model and organizational structure so that you can act on the data that you've collected. Takeaway number two, if everyone else has the same data you have, that data is worthless. How do you harvest data that no one else has that you can pump into that, that process? Okay? So anyway, gotta go. Sorry about this. Thanks so much. Um, and by the way, one thing, that ha one thing that, that Clark probably told you is Haas, you know what Haas stands for, right? What does it stand for? 
What? No. Haas as a service, right? So we, we're, in, we're, in the, uh, we're in the subscription okay. business, uh, and that means that you know, we want to keep in touch with you, not just after today, but throughout. So I'm sure Clark probably invited you to connect on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, and then you know, I'll see you occasionally. I'll be like, oh, they're doing some cool stuff. That's great. So, so you know, do that.